All right, welcome everyone to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. It's good to be here. It's always good to be here, isn't it, Troy? Oh, it's always great to be here. It is us doing this, and we enjoy it. We we love having a little bit of a chat. Um, I want to give a little bit of a shout out to all of our socials and things like that at the start. This year, in our show notes, you may have noticed if you looked in the show notes that we have a link tree link in there, which has a link to all of our socials and all those different things. So we are now on YouTube. We've got the Facebook listener group. We've got Reddit, we've got Instagram, we've got Twitter. You can grab our merch from Redbubble. And also, if you could support us through Patreon, that is always appreciated too, as it helps with all the costs of the podcast, advertising and stuff like that. But yeah, go into the show notes, have a look at Linktree. Yeah, and thank you to all the people that have volunteered to help out with that. Like Holly, for example, she set up the Linktree link there and she's also been doing our Instagram and she's also done some amazing work on some of those posts and some of those memes and bits and pieces. So big thanks to her. They make us look really good, our volunteers, don't they, Troy? That's that's certainly admin that helps us with the Facebook group. And also with the things like the socials with Holly, we're, we're, we're looking a little bit more polished. I know, it's looking a bit swish, which is good. Now, hey man, today I feel we get a bit of, you know, a bit sort of investigative journalist kind of feel today with what we're going to do this episode. I think this is going to be an interesting one. It is. Well, you better keep it to 60 minutes in uh, in theme with the investigative journal journalism. I didn't say that very well. That's investigative journalism. Keep it to within 60 minutes. I see what you're saying. So you're saying we're going to be like a foreign correspondent. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Four yeah. corners, four <laughs> corners, right? Oh, no, no. Okay, I get it. I get it. So you're making reference to that old classic 60 Minutes, which I don't know how it is in the US now, but in Australia, it's become a lot more like a current affair and a less, and less, you know, 60 minutes y like it used to. Have you noticed that? It's terrible. We actually watched it last week. Just um, there's a story on there that piqued our interest on the ad. And yeah, it was. It was a little bit tabloid. wasn't impressed with it. And uh, we might be watching it again in a hurry. Yeah, I mean, it always was Channel 9, but Channel 9's just become even more Channel 9, haven't they? Yeah, it has. And for our uh, overseas viewers on Australia, Channel 9 is, yeah, it's just one of your garden variety. Network TV stations, yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah it's right. rubbish. But today, nepotism. Oh, yes. So this is a good one, nepotism. Because it's just rife within Australian Pentecostalism and, and evangelicalism. I mean, it's rife in evangelicalism globally, to be honest. But I, I think this one is, this is the kind of stuff that it's just so glaringly obvious. It's just right there. And I think that Pentecostalism in Australia really, and megachurches in Australia, really don't think there's anything wrong with this. They, it's, they're so blind to it that they're just, open and you know they're even going to be like I, I dare say you know if any, any pentecostal mega mega church pastors are listening to this they're going to be going well, what's wrong with this this is the way we've always done it this is the way it's always been what what are you talking about that's something wrong with this gotta pass the mantle brother and you know anyone who is is not familiar with nepotism it's the practice amongst those with power or influence of favoring relatives or friends especially by giving them jobs and we saw this you know outside of the church in the trump administration where he had his daughter as an advisor had his son-in-law as a an advisor and none of them in any sort of way had any qualifications to do those jobs except to say that they were related that's right. So it is. It is very common. Did you see they joked a lot about bringing your daughter to work day, when um, <laughs> he was bringing uh, Ivanka? Was that his name? I think it is Ivanka. Yeah, Ivanka yeah. Trump. When he was bringing her in, it was like, oh, daddy daughter work day, and bring your daughter to work day, and all this. Kind of stuff. <laughs> but you know, most companies and government agencies and NGOs, etc., they have rules in place to counter nepotism because it's yeah. basically not fair and it's not on, and yet. We will see today as we sort of look at what's going on in, in evangelicalism a little bit in the world, but then really focusing on in on Australia, we're going to really see that it is it is rife, it is endemic, and they really don't see a problem with it. No, they don't, unfortunately, and um, it is completely wrong. But it doesn't just sit within 
Pentecostalism, evangelicalism. It definitely sits within the world in many, many areas. And, you know, ruling dynasties of the world is just one of them, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at monarchies. I mean, this is what monarchies were basically based on nepotism. I mean, that's the idea, right? Is that it's hereditary title, it's handed on to your children. So we see that with, of course, you know, still to this day, the British monarchy, you know, is still very, you know, obviously nepotistic, but they don't have the power that they once had. But nevertheless, there's still, you know, titles that are bestowed and and jobs and all that kind of thing is is given to the British monarchy. I think the one that stands out to me, though, is the Thai monarchy. Yeah. So the Thai loved the, the the older king, the one who passed away more recently, and they weren't very fond of his son. You know, when he was the prince, there was a lot of backlash against him because he wasn't doing a very good job of being the the crown prince. And then when he became the king, there's not that same love and adoration that they have, but this is who gets it. It gets given to the son or gets, you know, which, whichever son it happens to be given to for whatever reason, it, because it, that's the, the dynasty. The dynasty is is handed on from father to son or father to daughter or whatever. I remember uh, my partner and I were actually in Thailand whenever that was, five or six years ago when, when the king died. And we left and he he died within hours of, of us leaving and friends were there at the same time and apparently everything shut down. Like the whole country just shut down and went into mourning. So they really took that seriously and you're right, they absolutely loved him. But the son has been, um, he's, he's known for his playboy lifestyle, flying around on private jets and doing whatever he wants. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think he's popular. I think you're right. No, no, they're, they're not fans. So obviously the world moved away from monarchies, right, because it's basically not fair. And the world moved, you know, to more democracy, whether that's just in name or whether it's really in practice. And so the idea of democracy is that our, you know, everybody has a voice. I mean, that's what democracy means. It's listening to the voices of the people. And so our society, you know, Western liberal democracies, of course, we have multi-party systems, people are voted in and out. Um, but still, nepotism is quite strong in, in you know, different areas of our, of our world. But I want to make the point that as a society, we have moved away from the idea of giving things directly to your children because simply they are your children, or I should say giving jobs and power and positions of power to your children. So that's a really important point to make, that this is not the way the world runs, or at least Western liberal democracies. But let's talk about where we do see nepotism rife in, in governments today. And we are going to go somewhere with this. We just want to sort of set the scene with this. So what's the first one? Be? That would be our old mate Kim Jong Un. And where did he come from? Kim Jong Il. And where did he come from? Can you go that far back? Oh, oh no. Kim Il Sung. Oh, well, there you go. See, look at you. You're a wealth of political knowledge. Um, look, it's a world of bad haircuts. That's what it is. But um, North Korea, rife with this stuff. And as we can see, it doesn't work extremely well when you see some of that secret footage that comes out of North Korea of how malnourished people are, how unwell they are, how they can't get health care. This shit doesn't work. But, you know, they've got lots of good nuclear weapons. So that's the main thing, isn't it? Well, the thing about them as well is that there's a spirituality, there's a almost godlike quality to these, to these three men. And so this sort of mantle this, you know, um, lineage, divine lineage, you know, they're sort of handed on from one generation to the next. And maybe that's already starting to sound familiar, but that's what's happening. And we, as, as Western nations, we look at that and go, that's bullshit. That's not the way it is at all, right? People need to be voted in or people need to, you know, demonstrate their, their merit and then they can have positions of power, which leads us on to sort of more recent American presidential dynasties, right? So like the Bushes, for example. So we see that Bush Sr. was the president. A couple of presidents later, Bush Jr. gets in. And then when we look at the Clintons, you know, Bill Clinton was the president and, you know, his wife was all of a sudden, the, you know, Secretary of State under Obama and then she's running for president herself. If you think that's not because she's connected to 
the power brokers and, you know, her husband, well, you're kidding yourself, right? Of course. So we see that even in the American system. But the difference between the American system and, say, the North Korean system is people still need to vote and people still need to choose. So ultimately, you can be connected, but that's no guarantee. Whereas in North Korea, well, it's a guarantee. So the other one, Brian, is Singapore. Now, Singapore is interesting. Well, you're, you you have first-hand knowledge of this. You, you lived there. So th- let me tell you about Singapore. Now, the thing about Singapore is it's dressed up as a Western liberal democracy. That is, you know, multi-party state, parliament, yada, yada. But the reality is the same party has been in power since the 1960s, since they declared independence from, from you know, the UK and also independence from Malaysia. So they were briefly part of Malaysia. And there's a guy by the name of Lee Kuan Yew. Now, the thing about it, as I said, is it's dressed up as a liberal democracy, but it's actually a single party system. And what happened when Lee Kuan Yew, he was just in power forever for a very long time. And then when it was time for him to retire, his own son wasn't really old enough or experienced enough to take over. So what he did was he handed it on to this guy named Go Chok Tong. And Go Chok Tong became the prime minister. But Lee Kuan Yew stayed in this role called senior minister, which basically meant I'm still in control, I'm still in power. Do you remember it was kind of like that with Putin when Putin stepped out for a little while because the you know, constitution said he couldn't have it. So he stepped out, gave it to someone else for a period of time and then came back. Lee Kuan Yew never came back. But what he did do eventually was he handed on the power or Go Chok Tong handed on the power to his son, Lee Sin Long. All right. So eventually he gave the power to his son. Now, again, the thing about it is it's supposed to be a Western liberal, Western style liberal democracy, but really it's just very much like North Korea. But but all the show that is there, all the dressings are there of, you know, oh, it's not nepotistic. But of course, in true, true Asian fashion, he handed everything that he had on to his firstborn son. Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Corruption begets corruption as well, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it's a it's an institutionalized corruption. That's the thing about Singapore. That's the thing that I noticed when I was there. It's not illegal. Um, the the laws are actually supporting those in in power and those that are that are holding the power to maintain the power. So it's institutionalized corruption. Is the best way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Scary stuff, but it's everywhere, isn't it? But but then we come back to the uh, Pentecostal evangelical scene. Frank Schaefer from a few weeks ago, you know, he really spoke about this, didn't he, in his experience about his father and the mantle being passed to him. And I think he spoke in the episode about how at one stage someone actually said to him, the mantle of your father has been passed on to you. And for him, he had a real reaction to that. And he was like, fuck, no, I don't want this. Yeah, he he said, remember, the only reason I was invited to speak, the only reason I was where I was, was because I was my father's son. It had nothing to do with merit, nothing to do with strength. But then he felt that he was recognised as eventually being a better speaker than his father and, you know, more active than his father, etc. But that's not how he got there. He got there simply because he was the son of Francis Schaeffer, evangelical writer and superstar. Well, that's right. And he was speaking on the world stage, flying around in Jerry Falwell's jet. At the time, he was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know, for a four or five year period. I mean, you don't really have the experience that age to be able to speak on a world stage with authority just through your own gifts and talents, do you? So you have to have that passed on and something that Penties and evangelicals are, are brilliant at is going, don't worry about how old they are or don't worry about their experience. They're my child, or they're my relation, or just trust me. The old just trust me. That's right. Now, biblically, the, the mantle was passed from the king to the son, not yep. the prophetic mantle, right? So let's make that clear. It was the kingship that was handed on from father to son. And you could you could argue, oh well, you know the the, the tribe of the Levites, that you know priestly role was handed on from father to son. One hundred percent, you could argue that. But I just want to stress that the idea of a prophetic mantle, when we look at like Elijah to Elisha and these kinds of people, they weren't related. All right, so that the, the prophetic one is not handed from father to son. But I want to really stress again, it's back to that hereditary title. It's an ancient form of government where. It's just given to the son because the son is the son, 
And there's no such thing in the New Testament. We don't see any of that. Jesus didn't have his own kids, the apostles and the prophets, of evangelists, all these kinds of things. We don't read anything in the Bible about mantles being handed on from father to son or mother to daughter or anything like that. I mean, you could argue from their perspective, and even if you look at today's royals, that they are groomed from birth. And I'm sure that all the royals of days gone by and any of these dictatorships that are happening in history and now, that they're groomed from the day that they're born to take up that role. So from their perspective, they're like, well, this person will definitely be the best person for it because we've actually trained them in how to respond. They become like a ruling class within the church, don't they? Uh, Yeah, absolutely they do. It is frightening. So American evangelicalism is ridiculously nepotistic, all right? So we see um, Jerry Forwell Sr. handing everything on to Jerry Forwell Jr. And then, of course, all the scandals and everything that have happened in there. We see Billy Graham Evangelistic Association handed on to Franklin Graham. Um, And we could list off a whole heap. It is the way that it's done in America. Now, I like what Frank Schaefer said. Do you remember? He said, if you did this in business in America, you would go to jail. The way that they just hand everything on from father to son and the, and the, and the rife nepotism, you would go to jail because it's just not allowed. And I don't know if you've seen that show, The Righteous Gemstones, which is a TV show on HBO in the US, but it's on Foxtel and Binge here in Australia on those streaming services. That is a prime example of everything that we are talking about. So if you if you want to go and have a look, please pop over to those um, those channels, watch The Righteous Gemstones, and you're going to see exactly what we are talking about when we talk about American evangelicalism and nepotism. And look, you you do look at it and go, oh, God, this is far-fetched, but reflect on it. And, of course, there's a little bit of drama in it, but it's exactly what happens. Um, And I think the theme of that show is exactly what happens. Sadly, I mean, I remember Frank saying that in terms of Billy Graham, he thought Billy Graham was a very sincere person, but Franklin Graham, he's picked up the mantle and is insincere and far right and frank goes as far as saying that these mobs are criminal enterprises remember he said that that's exactly what he said yeah well that's the thing i think about the righteous gemstones when you watch the righteous gemstones you see the the father's character john goodman's character is actually quite sincere yeah and he's often face palming at his kids behavior and and we'll come back to this a little bit later because there's one one case in particular in Australia where I know that the senior pastor of the church is just face palming at what his kids are actually up to. Brian, before we get into what we're about to talk about, I just want to say to those that are listening, hold your lawyers, okay? We are making no accusation of any illegal actions, okay? So we are not in any way saying that anyone's done anything illegal that, that's not already on public record, etc. But we are asking, is this ethical and is this right? And from a church perspective, even more so, shouldn't the standard be even higher? You would think so, wouldn't you? And look, I think we're going to talk through Australian examples primarily, but I'm sure that you could lift these in your local community, your country, wherever you may be listening from. And I'm sure that there are thousands of examples of this very same thing. And if you are listening from outside of Australia, you know, you can Google these and verify these stories that we we are going to be telling. The names won't be changed to protect the innocent because we'll use their actual names because that is... um, Oh, yeah, this is all... This is all public record, and this is most of this has come from Wikipedia, which is written by their fans. I mean, have you? I don't know if you went and had a look at the articles. In fact, you did. I know you did. But when you look at the articles, it's so it, they're puff pieces, really, about just the wondrous wonderfulness of of these people and these churches, which again demonstrates what I was trying to say at the very beginning. They don't even think there's anything wrong with this. Otherwise, they wouldn't be broadcasting it like they do. No, that's right. And, and But it doesn't take long to, I mean, you look back on the Righteous Gemstones and sure, that's a bit theatrical, but the exact same thing happens in these families that they, they have obscene wealth. I mean, you, you see it more in those mega pastors in, in the States in flying around their private jets and have their enormous mansions. But these same people talk about 
justice and they talk about protecting and looking after the widows and all of that. But you don't go as far as actually sharing your goods because God's actually given you those, especially for you because you're so faithful. Oh, that's right. When Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything you have, I was talking to him. He wasn't talking to us. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. And, you know, the old through the eye of a needle, easier to get a camel. No, don't worry about that. Oh, yeah. Have you you heard the story? Oh, there was actually a gate in in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle and you had to actually take everything off your camel and put the camel through the gate. And it's all bullshit. That, that, that gate never existed. They used to just go in through the gate. you know. And so the idea was they said if you take everything off the camel, go through the eye of the needle, then put everything back on the camel. In other words, give it all up, come to Christ, but then you can start rebuilding it again. Bullshit. That's just not there. I think you've got a lack of faith, and um, I think you'll be held to account for this. I don't know, man. I was pretty passionate then. I think it sounded like I had a lot of faith. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, this happens all through and, you know, it's it's not what this episode's about, but it's definitely sits in there behind the scenes that, that people misinterpret and interpret any of those ancient scriptures or words in a way which benefits themselves and justifies their behaviour. And suits themselves, indeed. Well, let's start with the Evans clan. So they are a big uh, Australian Christian Church's Assemblies of God family from South Australia. So you've probably heard of the Evans clan. I'm going to read some stuff. As I said, most of this comes from Wikipedia. And Brian, you just stop me whenever you want to talk about anything. But let's start with Andrew Evans. He was born to missionary parents, Tom and Stella Evans, and he's the older brother of Pastor Fred Evans, right? So even At that generation, we're already starting to see very strong assemblies of God presence and very, you know, very much in the family. Um, He studied for Christian ministry at the Assemblies of God Bible College, now known as, I don't know, how do you say this, Alpha Cruxus, Alpha Crucius? I I think it's Alpha Crucius or something like that, Yeah. yeah. He was ordained for ministry in 1963, served as a missionary with the AOG World Missions, and then he became the senior pastor in 1970 of um, Clemsig. Is that how you say this in Adelaide? Uh, uh, It's in Adelaide. Does it really matter? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Okay. So first pastor, I think it's Clemsig Assembly of God. And then that became known as Paradise AOG. So some of you are going to know that one, right? Now called Influences Church, which sounds (laughs) like, I know, which sounds like it's the church you know, we're not trying to get the movie stars and pop stars. We're now trying to get all the YouTubers into a What a... Fu- I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. What a fucking stupid name for a church. Influences Church. Isn't it? I, I'm loving all these different names of churches, how they're rebranding away from Assemblies of God and and Christian City and whatever. And they think they're being relevant. That That's the funny thing. Like when you see it from the outside and you look at them and go, oh, and, and you say to your friends... It's obviously going to be a lot more palatable to go, where are you going this weekend? I'm going to Influences or I'm going to Stairway. I mean, fuck off. Planet Shakers, there's there's a humble name. Global Senior Interim Pastor fucking, yes. (laughs) Indeed. Anyway, Influences Church, come on. Great, great name. I mean, so bad. I mean, Bobby and Brian must just be jealous. Influences Church. Anyway, so... In 1977, he became the National Superintendent of the Assemblies of God. This is Andrew Evans. Mm. And he held that position for 20 years. So you don't get any higher than that. So one of the biggest churches in Australia, true to, you know, like Rome was the biggest church. So the, you know, the Roman head became the Pope. So too, these guys were huge and he became the, the head of that. Again, can you remember the, the I'm sure you do, the the basically the fame and glory that surrounded Ab, Andrew Evans when we were in Great Big AOG? I mean, that was in his prime in his last, probably last five to 10 years of being superintendent, but he would come and speak. He was often spoken about. He was really seen as someone who did have a great deal of power and influence. Indeed, indeed. Now, there was a guy named... Danny Guglielmucci, that's how you say it properly, apparently. I heard him once correct us, but he was known as Danny Gug, Danny Guglielmucci. Do you remember him? Now, he was yeah. Evans's assistant pastor for a very long time in Paradise AOG, while Evans's own boys, Ashley and Russell, were young. So Guglielmucci, remember Go Chok Tong, right? So Guglielmucci is the two I see because, you know, Ash and Russ are too young. 
but they eventually became youth pastors and youth leaders, right? Mm. So they were stepped into that role. Now I want to tell a bit of a story and this comes firsthand. So I was at a youth a live conference in the 90s and Danny Gugliamucci stood up and he gave us a sermon, you know, but, but before he did the sermon, he started to talk about this thing that he called jobs for the boys. Yeah. And he stood up there and he said, people look at me having made Ashley and Russell Evans youth pastors in, in the church and they think, oh, he's just given jobs for the boys because of Andrew Evans. And he stood up there and he just mocked anyone that would dare consider or accuse him of just feathering the nest for his boss's own boys. And it was kind of like, you know, that I fear thou dost protest too much because yeah. it's like that's exactly what you've done. You know, you you know that if you give amazing jobs to these guys, you're going to find favour with your boss and it's going to be a good thing for you. So I can remember him standing there at this Youth Alive conference. It was at the Ramada Hotel up in the Gold Coast in, in Surface Paradise. And he sat there and told us all about people around saying, oh, you're just giving jobs to the boys, blah, blah, blah. And even at the time I was like, but I think he did. This happened all the time in terms of um, from the pulpit you heard, you know, the best, certainly the best method of defence was offence and they would often go on the offensive and often go and try and discredit a theory or a belief rather than defending their own. So they would really attack. So that that's completely within character. Yeah, for sure. So Paradise was huge. It was a really big church. They started Youth Alive South Australia and the Evans boys, right? This is Ashley and Russell, not to be confused with Cousin David, who was a singer. They were high profile in that. And I assume that they ran that at some stage. Now, I tried to do my research and I can't say that 100%, but I'm 99% sure. But nevertheless, I can't say 100% that the um, the Evans boys were at the helm, but I'm pretty, pretty sure. Was this around the stage they took it back from the apostolics? Yeah, right. They took it back from the apostolics. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. No, I don't think they needed to because they never fucking let it go. No. No. So... Southside Christian Church was established in 1994. That was like a, a satellite church of paradise. And Danny Gugliamucci took off and pastored that. Then in 1997, the contemporary worship music band Planet Shakers was created out of the first Planet Shakers conference, right? So in Hillsong-esque style, right? Oh, look, Hillsong have a, a conference called Hillsong. We're going to start our own, call it Planet Shakers. And eventually, we're even going to name our church after our conference. It's just like fucking predictable. But anyway. But it's, you know, it's a proven recipe that works, isn't it? And for Planet Shakers, it worked too. I mean, they, they went huge. I mean, they're nothing like Hillsong, I don't think. I mean, they've got a bit of fame and adoration. Well, they want to be. Yeah, they want to be. Um, but they've got a bit of fame and adoration in Australia. But I'm not sure that they necessarily went global like Hillsong, certainly didn't go as big as Hillsong, but they tried and bless them. Yeah, bless them. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> blessed be. So here we go, though. Listen to this. In 2000, Andrew Evans' youngest son, Ashley, and his wife, Jane, took over as senior pastors at Paradise. So in that Singapore-style model, they weren't old enough, so Danny Goog had it, but then when they became old enough, Andrew Evans stood down and gave the entire church all the assets, everything that's controlled by the senior pastor, right, and by the board, etc., all fell to the hands of Ashley and his wife. And then the Planet Shakers youth movement grew in this. So we've still got Russell is still involved very strongly in there. And as we said, it's now known as the Influencers Church um, in an attempt to attract YouTubers. When you say, you know, all of those assets and buildings and things like that um, are handed over, surely that belongs to the people, to the congregation, wouldn't you think? Well, on paper it does. On paper it 100% does. And so, again, we're not claiming anybody doing anything illegal here. But you and I know that a lot of these boards in these churches are actually stacked with people who are in full support of the dynasty. 
So you're not going to put anybody in there that's going to turn around and and threaten that. So yes, it doesn't. It's not owned by Andrew Evans. It's not owned by Ashley and Russell Evans, etc. But they have control over this as the senior pastors of these churches. Sorry, I, I baited you with that one. So, but I got the answer I wanted, so it was good. It's exactly yeah, 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 no, it's important to point out because that way we keep the lawyers at bay. Now, in two thousand and four. Russell and his wife, Sam, I'm guessing that's Samantha. They're not mm, that inclusive. Not, not Samuel. No, moved to Melbourne to form the Planet Shakers Church. So now what we've got is we've got the head of the AOG, superintendent of the AOG for a very long time. He eventually stands down. Now his two boys are running two of the largest, most powerful churches, not only in the Australian Christian churches, but also in Australia. I do remember when it moved into Melbourne, it sort of it made waves. Um, and I, rem- I remember there being lots of conversation around it. And they took over a big conference centre from memory. So very, very much like a, a Hillsong-esque type model. And I, re- I remember people just gushing about this place. It was the new latest and greatest. I don't know if it still exists. I'm oh, sure yeah. it does. Yeah, it's still rocking. They've got multi campuses, of course. <laughs> of that's good. What you do. And 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 they they call themselves like Planet Shakers International and Influencers Church International and they've all got multi campuses. So there's these you know they they want to be Hillsong. They want to break away and be super huge, but they're still staying within the AOG, but they're pretending like they're separate it's it's just fucking weird they're influencers though well they are influencers indeed yes now here's the thing i want to stress we have a problem okay our first little example of this some of the most powerful strongest families and churches here we have nepotism all right so this is serious mum nepotism Mm. do you want to talk to us about what happened after that with the guliamuchis I'm just going to say the googs, just just because my my accent isn't great. My Italian, the only Italian word I remember from high school was fungal. Uh, that's 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 about it. And I'm sorry for offending any Italian listeners. Fungal, <laughs> fungal, and all yeah, that. Like the Sopranos. <laughs> I did love the Sopranos, but do you remember they actually said that in Greece? Remember, Greece was a. PG, and because they probably didn't think that anyone would have understood it, it's a fun goal in there. Yeah, but when you said Greece, then I was going to say, no, that's Pusti Malaka, but you meant the movie. <laughs> I did, I did. So back to the Googs. So Danny, we've spoken about Danny, but in, in 2006, the Googs, Southside Christian Church, was <laughs> became Edge Church, not just Edge Church, but Edge Church International. Well, there you go. See, there it is. Everything that I just said, change the name. And you know, they don't change the name because they're trying to distance themselves from bullshit. They change the name because they're trying to be cool and hip. It's marketing. Like all of these big churches these days have a Marcoms department. They're very good at it. Like if, if, I mean, we've reflected on this before. If you have a look at Pentecostal churches, they are the ultimate marketing machines and their comms are very slick, very, very slick, have some great little snippets and clips and they're very emotive, very, very good. Indeed. And what did um, El Hardy say? You know, no one uses social media like the Penties. That's right. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I don't follow any Penty churches on social media, but I certainly have seen clips. Um, and I've seen parodies of those clips, which are very funny. Danny's son, Michael. Now, he became pastor at Russell Evans's church, Planet Shakers. What, what's happening here? Hello. Jobs for the boys. See, remember, Danny gave positions to his boss's boys. Now, what happens here? Years later... I, I think it's purely coincidental. Jobs I, for the boys. <laughs> no, coincidental. I, I, I don't know what you're inferring. I mean, this is ridiculous. I, you, you're drawing ridiculous conclusions here. So the, Evans, so the Evans boy gave the Gugliamucci boy a job. Now, how do we define nepotism again? Let me just go back up here and have a look. Um, the practice amongst those with power or influence of favouring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. Oh, you're a cynic. You're a cynic. With good reason as we go on. So it was reported in 2008 that Michael Gook, pastor of the church and former 
bass player in Planet Shaker's band. <laughs> <laughs> the song, they weren't connected. No, no. He had fraudulently claimed that he was dying of cancer. <gasps> I'm fraudulently upset by that. <laughs> I, I am too. I look. I remember this one well. I was I was out of the fold, and I remember watching this from afar. And I remember there was lots and lots of prayer chains happening. My my mum was still very involved, and still is very involved in the evangelical scene, and lots of prayer chains. Lots of prayer chains for Danny. Uh, sorry, for Michael. Cause, he uh, was the one, by the way, I just want to quickly point out that he was the one that um, Fiona Newton said, told him, oh, don't um, set up a youth group with all these poor kids because they can't tithe. Yes, yes, that's that's correct. That was Michael Guglielmucci. The Googstar. And the soprano. <laughs> At this time, he wrote Healer a song of encouragement for believers who were suffering from cancer for the album Saviour of the World. And now this was released in 2007. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm I'm fraudulently touched by this. (laughs) I think I genuinely feel sick from this. The Goog, he performed the song regularly over a two-year period, often with oxygen tubes up his nose. Fraudulently up his (laughs) nose. Oh, no, they were genuinely up his nose. And during this time, he received money from supporters who believed his illness was real. So so you're saying here that he was not sick. He told everybody he was sick. He was releasing almost Christmas songs basically about his sickness. He's got tubes up his nose and oxygen bottles, and but it was all fake. Yeah, and not only this, but again... We see Planet Shakers and Hillsong do a little bit of a collab here because that track, Healer, was added to their Hillsong's album, This Is Our God, scandalously later removed. Oh, praise the Lord, fraudulently (laughs) removed. (laughs) No, no, it was genuinely removed. Um, But the Googster... He uh, later explained his actions. What do you? I mean, his actions of believing that he had cancer, or well, not believing, fraudulently deceiving everyone that he had cancer. What was it from? A long-term porn addiction. Sorry, I, I don't understand that. So you're saying that instead of saying, "Oh, look, I was overwhelmed. I was pushed to succeed, and there was too much pressure on me," he actually said, "Oh, it's because I'm into porn." Yes, it's an obvious link. I mean, can't you see it? No. <laughs> Either can I. Um, the old Googster was full of shit. And uh, and I stand by that uh, because it was proven. Uh, so representatives of the church with the, who the Goog had affiliations told the press they were totally unaware of this situation. They weren't part of this scam. And in an email sent to Hillsong members, the church's general manager George Afghanistani. Yeah, I don't even know how to pronounce that one, but George Agadajdani um, said the news was even a shock to the Gug's own family. Mm, I, but I do remember, in defence of his father, Danny, I do remember when he came out to speak about this at that time, he did look genuinely shocked. He looked He looked like he was genuinely hurting and destroyed by what his son had done. I mean, it was messed up. It wasn't getting up on stage once at uh, during a sermon and going, oh, guys, I've got cancer, pray for me. I mean, this was a scam that went on for a couple of years. It raked in a fuckload of money um, because you had to support... Michael and, you know, pray for him and heal, but also give him a um, a little bit of a financial boost at the time. Oxygen bottles aren't free. They're not free, but I, I do wonder what was actually in those bottles. I, I think it was an early forming form of vaping. This was back in like 2007, but there was something going up his nose and it certainly wasn't oxygen. Yeah, for, the, for the sake of lawyers, we just want to stress that that was a joke. So, you know, his whole family was shocked, you know, old Googs. So what did they do at that time? They stripped him of all his credentials as a minister. That was the Australian Christian churches at the time stripped him. And they promised that all money donated by listeners inspired by that song would be returned to them or 
donated to charity. Now, what charity do you think that that might have gone to, given that churches have charity status? Well, I reckon it might have been something to do with Edge Church International. Yeah, like quite Australian possibly. Christian churches? It wouldn't be that hard to actually return the money to people because generally you have to put your details when you donate. So they But not necessarily, Brian, because you think about it, there'd be those, you know, those mauve coloured bags that are handed around in the in the services and people would just be sticking cash in. I think it'd be like my old mate who was asking for forty four gallon drums to be filled with cash. I reckon <laughs> that would have been happening. Um but yeah, look it, either way, whatever. Like he was stripped, he was disgraced. The, really, the family was disgraced, weren't they? They were, and so that should have been the end of him, right? Really, from from if that had happened in the in inverted commas real world, then that would be the end of someone. They're disgraced. They're out. They're gone. You know, go and work at Macca's. You know, get a job at Coles New World or whatever it is, because he probably doesn't have a lot of options. Hang on, what? are you saying? Are you what? saying it wasn't the end of him? I, I don't know. You, you, this is your story. Oh, my God. I can't believe that you're inferring that it wasn't the end of him. It should have been, right? Hmm. Wait, there's more. Mm. Fast forward a few years to 2014 and Edge Church, or should we say Edge Church International, saw a major transition in leadership from Pastor Danny Gook as the founding pastor to its current lead pastor, Jonathan Fontenorosa, if that is how you say his name. That's like a kind of pizza. I, I've got nothing <laughs> against Italians, all right? But is that an Italian name? Is that a, an Italian guy giving the church to another Italian guy? I think it's, um, there's a Calibrian link Fontanarosa. here. Yeah, Fontanarosa. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let, let's call, call him Johnny Font. Johnny Font. Johnny hey, Font. hey, it's Johnny Font. What you doing? Vafungu. Hey. Are you talking to me? So Danny Googs gives this to Johnny Font. And then... But because he can't give it to his son. Let's make that clear. You, you cannot be giving the church now to to the disgraced, oxygen-wearing, cancer-lying, fraudulent son. No, you, you can't. Even your own AOG, ACC, they're not going to put up with that. We know that. No, this isn't going to happen. Yeah. Fast forward again, a few more years. So Guglamici, or the Googs, and his wife of 20 years, Amanda, this is in 2021. This is Michael. Oh, sorry, this is Michael. Yep. This, is, this is Michael. This is Mr. Mr. Fakey, registered Lighthouse City Mission Incorporated. It's incorporated, of course, as a charity helping the financially disadvantaged people with chronic illness, migrants, refugees, and the general community in Australia. Now, are they real chronic illnesses that he's supporting people or you just have to say you've got one? That, it, they can be fraudulent ones. <laughs> like <can't> it's, be. <laughs> yeah, no, they'll support fraudulent ones. Um, but, you know, any any gifts or money or any offerings taken will be returned to people. Or Sure, sure. Uh, it's all been returned, but now we're going to start taking them again. There's a mansion in heaven, mm. so it's fine. And I can tell you what money it was built with. Can I just say something here before you go on? No. Okay. Okay, go. People are going to listen to this, right, people that are still in the fold and saying these guys are just being so negative and they're just being, you know, so against the work of the Lord, etc. Fuck off, all right, because this is for real. This is real money, real people, real lives, and this is something straight out of HBO's acclaimed series, The Righteous Gemstones. It totally is. Uh, I mean, if I transfer it into my everyday life, in the organisation I worked for, if my CEO bought in her son or her husband or someone and said, oh, you know what, I'm going to step down and I'm going to pass on the running of this uh, mid-sized business to them, it, there would be an uproar. There would be an absolute uproar because they don't have the, the skills to run it. They don't have the background nor the qualifications. But we accept that. We accept it within the Penty and evangelical circles. Mm. So here we have, we've, we've got Michael and Amanda. They've set up Lighthouse City Mission Incorporated. Don't forget it's incorporated. That makes it a little bit more legitimate. Their godly instructions included that he and his spouse, or 
Team Gorg, should they resign their roles at his father Danny's church, Edge Church International, and sell their home and relocate to Port Adelaide? Now, that came from the NewYorkPost.com, right? So what we're saying there is that he got godly instructions wherever the godly instructions came from, which means that they had to sell everything. didn't mean they had to give the money away. They just sell everything, relocate. But what's really important is they resign their roles at their father's church, at Danny Goog's church, resign mm. their roles. This is in 2021. So what does that mean, Brian? That means that they were back employed to lead the fold who they'd fraudulently deceived, set, well, not they, he had several years back. So his dad had basically, after all that bullshit, hired him back onto staff at the Edge Church. Yeah, well, he'd obviously do dealt with his porn addiction at that time, so he'd have no temptation to then lead people astray with his fraudulent claims. Like setting up another charity. So let me go back and look at nepotism again. What's that definition? The practice among those with power or influence of favouring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. So because he'd lost his gig at Planet Shakers, Danny Goog gave his son a job at his church again, at Edge Church. Hmm. Fuck me. Yeah, well, you know, you've, you've got to look after your kids, get them back in the family business. It's a family business, isn't it? Jobs for the boys. Again, jobs for the boys. I wonder if he stood up at the Youth Alive conference that year and said, well, oh, people own jobs for the boys. I gave my son a job back. Jobs for the boys. I bet you he didn't say that fucking year. Well, it wasn't just jobs for the boys. It was jobs for both Michael and Amanda. So it was jobs for the boys and the, and the girls. Yeah, that's right. Team Goog. Jobs for Team Goog. <laughs> that's right. The old Googs. Now, look, we say this. We say all this not to completely bag these people out and go, they're a bunch of scammers. They're absolutely deceitful people. This, this is to point out the absurdity of what happens also, the absolute absurdity. And to a degree, you know, we, we really need to point that out. I mean, this stuff doesn't happen by coincidence. Yeah, and this is all public record, all right? So please go and do a Google search on that. So that's that's the first big... Don't you mean a googly Amici search? Yeah, a googly, do a googly search. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's one of the big families, right? That's the Evanses and also... You know, his, his Go Chok Tong, his 2IC, the Googliamoochies, right? So that's that's all that South Australian scandal. My own experience at the Revival Centres was Lloyd Longfield, who was the head pastor of the Revival Centre. His son was a pastor in the main Melbourne Revival Centre until he had a parting away with his fathers and went off and joined the AOG um, yeah. in the early 80s or in the mid 80s. Now, the whole kit and caboodle when Lloyd retired, was all handed on to Lloyd's second son, Simon. So there's another huge uh, empire, mm -hmm. Pentecostal empire, which was given from father. One son was being set up. That son didn't work out, so it was given to the next son, a la North Korea. And what we saw in Great Big AOG, Brian, do you remember, when we first got there, the senior pastor he had faced nepotism with the founding family of Great Big AOG. So he hadn't been part of that founding family. And somehow he found himself in that role of senior pastor. But when we first got there, do you remember his brother-in-law? So senior pastor's brother-in-law was the assistant pastor. Yep. And the senior pastor's son was the youth pastor. Yep. And then when the brother-in-law left, the, se the senior pastor's son became the assistant pastor. He did. So that was full. I mean, this is just anecdotally, this is our experience, both in the Revival Centre and also in Great Big AOG. Now, what happened in Great Big AOG is senior pastor didn't give his son the whole shebang and gave it to another pastor instead, who, by the way, looked just like his son. He did. But his son took on another mega church in another state. So jobs for the boys. Right, oh, he didn't give it to his own son, but his own son got a job in you know sort of Guglielmucci style off somewhere else. Oh, absolutely! Like it was again, but you know when when I think about this, I mean, remember back in season one, our interview with Anthony Van Brown that he spoke about when his world fell apart. The question for him was, 
I have done this all my life. I'm an evangelist. I'm pastor type roles that he had fulfilled. He was like, what else can I do? I was at Centrelink and I was saying to the people at Centrelink or whatever it was at the time, this is all I've done my life, all my life. I've, I've got no idea what I can do. So it's like these guys protect themselves so they don't have to fall out into the real world again or ever because a lot of them have never actually had a job outside the church because what else could they do? I mean, a lot of these skills aren't that transferable. I mean, that's what I found. When I left the ministry, I had to basically retrain. And luckily, I was quite young. I was only just about to turn 30. So, yeah, but I, I totally understand that. So I'm going to share this one. Now, there's a church in the suburbs of Melbourne in a place called Dingley Village, and it's called Echo Church. Now, I've just chosen this randomly. And what I mean by that is this is, you're going to see this in a lot of other churches, but here's one that we can just demonstrate. It's not just these big empires. It's also these small churches. Now, this church used to be known as Harvest Christian Life Center, and it was started by a guy named Tom Rawls. Do you remember Tom Rawls? I do remember Tom Rawls. Yep. He was he was instrumental also in Church of the Rock with Dave and Rosanna Palmer and connected to all that. Very much big in the Victorian Assembly of God. Now, when he left to go to Thailand as a missionary, this is Tom Rawls, his kids and family were all too young, so he took them all with him. So he had no one to give it to. But he gave it to a guy named Mike Smith, Pastor Mike Smith. And so Mike Smith took over Harvest Christian Life Centre, which I think used to be in Moorabbin. Okay. And then, or maybe it was always in Dingley, I'm not sure. But Mike Smith eventually renamed the church Destiny Church, as you do, right? God, <laughs> because it can't be called Harvest anymore. It sounds too much like um, a you know type of bread. So now it has to be called Destiny Church. But here we go. You ready? So Smith had that church from when Tom Rawls gave it to him sometime in the 90s. But in 2018, he handed the church to his daughter and son-in-law, Justin and Lee Box. Now, I don't know if he didn't have a son, but he gave it to his daughter. And it seems to me that sexism trumps nepotism here because he didn't just give it to his daughter, he gave it to the son, son-in-law. So the son-in-law becomes the senior pastor, but it's still in the family, if you know what I mean. Mm. And then in 2019, what did Justin and Lee do? Change the name of the church to Echo Church. Church. Echo Church. Echo, church. Yeah, that's right. Echo Chamber. Echo Chamber. <laughs> yes, Echo Chamber Church. By the way, they're very strongly affiliated with Bethel, not just the Australian Christian churches. Churches, 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 churches. So this is Echo Church, right? So interestingly, the worship leader's name, this is all on their website, all right? I didn't make this up. Interestingly, the worship leader's name is Mitchell Smith. Remember Mike Smith? Now, Smith's, a, Smith's a common. Yeah, nah. it's true. Now, I'm not sure if there's any relation. <laughs> and in true journalist, journalistic fashion, I emailed them and said, <laughs> is, is Mitchell Smith related to Mike Smith? But they didn't reply. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah, so I can actually say, uh, we reached out to the blah, 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 but there was no reply, just like, just like on the news. Now, if someone could find out and put this in the Facebook group, that would be wonderful. Is Mitchell Smith related to... Um, Justin and Lee Box, but he's the worship leader, which is a big deal in these kinds of churches. They are multi-campus, I think, as well. I think that they possibly echo church international, national, national, national. I'm not sure. Nevertheless, smaller, much smaller situation here, but it's another church. Control of all the assets and all the money and all that kind of stuff is handed on to the family again. Dun, 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 dun. I think there's a theme. There is a theme. And they don't care. They don't think that they're doing anything wrong, right? Now, if, if you're working in a big multinational or you were working at um, a, a government department, you would be sacked for doing this. Yeah, but you know why? It's biblical. It's passing the mantle. Which is not biblical. We've already we've already said that precedent, right? It's, it's, it's just hereditary title, kings and queens and princes and princesses. Don't you know how to twist scripture? <laughs> not anymore. Once I could. <laughs> 
I do. There's there's a great a great song by a Christian band called the Rock and Rabbis that came out of Perth, and I, I, I did I, I knew the uh, the singer Owen Beck through one of my brothers, and they had this great song called "I'm Into Twisted Scripture," and it's a really good. Just Google the song. It's it's a fun song. The Rock the Rock and Rabbis are a fun band. To yeah, you to. actually put me onto that song back in the day. Yeah, wasn't it? Oh man, do it to us, that's great job. Something like that. That's how it went. Then it was sort of. It was like that. It was very tismish. Yes, tism again these days. This is are you? Yeah, nepotism. Yeah. Uh, All right. Now, here comes our favourite one, and I'm going to hand this one over to you because this is our favourite of all easy targets because this one is just a prime demonstration of like we we've shown you this is pretty full on right, but now when we get to this church nepotism goes to a whole new level yeah and look we we don't mean to single this church out except for we mean to single this church out uh, because it's it's really easy because they're in the bloody news all the time and we know this and again all of this is on the public record that'll be hillsong so where did hillsong start it all started with frank houston now frank was born in wanganui and i can tell you i've been to wanganui Oh, Brew, it's a suck place. I loved Wanganui. It was a, a beautiful little town up in the north of the North Island. So Frank, he was with the Salvos. Not long after turning 18, he married Hazel. They had five kids, including our favourite Houston, Brian. The couple transferred then to the Bapos and later to AOG in New Zealand. Went on and on through New Zealand, through to, you know, 1965 to 71, he served as the superintendent of the AOG in New Zealand. And in 77, they moved to Australia. So Hazel and Frank moved to Australia and founded the Sydney Christian Life Centre in Double Bay. Possibly fleeing accusations of sexual abuse, by the way. Yeah, that's right, because they they happened in the 60s and, as we know, were found to be true. So they're not just allegations. So they weren't affiliated with any denomination, then became the Assemblies of God, uh, affiliated with the Assemblies of God Church, and it moved to Darlinghurst and into a warehouse, very penty, move into a warehouse um, with a 600-seat auditorium, a Bible college and creative arts college, and lots of other stuff, which then continues today. So Houston by then had a problem, and but he was known as the bishop, and not an official title, but a humorous reference to mainstream churches. So they're taking the piss out of mainstream churches. Someone's bishop is actually a euphemism for your penis. So here's this sexual predator whose nickname in the church is penis, the penis. Yeah, pretty sickening, isn't it? Mm. So he's a, a bent unit. He was involved in over 20 Christian life centres being opened through New South Wales and overseas. So even back then, like Frank was planting away. Like this hasn't just been a Brian thing. Like this thing was expanding back then. And Frank served as pastor of his church for more than 20 years and other positions within the AOG. 1999, after consultation amongst senior pastoral staff of the church and the staff of Hills Christian Life Centre, a daughter church pastored by Brian at this time, the churches were merged to become Hillsong. So 1999, Hillsong was born. So basically he had given his jobs, you know, jobs for the boys. His son had a, a gig in the churches and then he was sent out to, to do others and then eventually he started his own. So it was, you know, this sort of dynasty thing was already starting back then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, what was being handed over to Brian just wasn't, you know, one little church. I mean, we've spoken about this. There was more than 20 churches already been planted uh, around Australia or in New South Wales and overseas. So the empire was already there. It had strong foundations. I'm going to hand to you to talk a little bit about Brian. Okay, well, you know, Brian came over with his dad and was involved in the church and, you know, obviously had a, had a leadership role. Eventually he took over everything and so he became the head of the Hills Christian Life Centre and, you know, and all those affiliated churches, but they were part of the Assemblies of God. And so in 1997, and I remember this, Houston was elected the president of the Assemblies of God in Australia, which is now the yeah. Australian Christian Churches, at the retirement of Andrew Evans. So this is another dynasty-ish family, dynasty-ish family that's basically taken control 
of the AOG. And then Houston eventually, as we know, you know, becomes head of this group called Hillsong and they break away from the AOG. So Hillsong is, excuse me, Houston, this is Brian Houston is now the executive producer of Hillsong Music Australia. And I dare say, I'm not saying this is for sure, but I dare say he's probably drawing some sort of massive wage for that and royalties, etc. In September 2018, they broke away from the Australian Christian churches and now they became, you know, Hillsong as we know them today. So Brian is the global senior pastor or the senior global pastor of Hillsong. And as we record this, he stepped down from that to face the, the, uh, the charges against his dad. Now, at the same time, though, and here's where it's, you know, this whole family business thing, he's got his wife, Bobby, and so it's Brian and Bobby. She's the co-global senior pastor. Mm. She hasn't stood down at the moment. She runs the weekly women's ministry at Hillsong. She started the Color Your World conference. She's also involved in the Color Sisterhood, which is a foundation set up by Hillsong through Hillsong Women and the women's ministry of the church, etc. So she's super involved there as well. So husband and wife massively tied into this and, and hold a lot of power. But what happens next, Brian? No, surely that's where it stops. Surely it's just with Brian and Barbie. Well, it wouldn't be jobs for the boys. No. I mean, you wouldn't think that Joel Houston was also, a, I mean, a co-pastor at Hillsong, New York, for example. So this is who? Who's Joel Houston? Joel is a son. Okay. So he, between 2010 and 2017, was the co-pastor. So I love how it's not an assistant pastor now, it's a co-pastor. So it's it's more of a um, more collaborative, isn't it? Mm, so maybe not old enough to be taking over yet, but old enough to be given a job. Yes. However, he still has a huge job, which is the head of Christian worship band, Hillsong United. Um, so he sings, plays guitar, writes songs for them. And in 2008, he became the creative director at Hillsong Church. So, you know, he did have a gig there before he went to Hillsong in New York as well. Hey, can I just say that the creative, you know, think about something like Hillsong where music and performance is everything. To be the creative director of that, ch that church is no small role. That's massive. Huge. That's massive. Yeah. But, you know, he was anointed. Daughter, Laura Togg, she's a pioneer of Young and Free. She got, um. sorry, I just wanted to say, Laura Togg, is she got a child named Dickie? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <He does. laughs> and just just for our listeners uh, that aren't familiar with the the swimmers called speedos, we call them dicky togs in Australia, in some parts of Australia. So she's obviously married someone else. That's why she's not Laura Houston. Yeah, I don't think she's tried to disassociate her, herself from the the family. That's for sure. Um, so together with her family. Well, her husband, Peter, uh, they pastor the youth ministry of Hillsong Church. God. Small gig. Small gig. But yeah, according to um, the, the website, she's a visionary. So much this is their own fun. website, by the way. This comes straight from Hillsong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a it's not, Yeah, just yeah. like her father, Pastor Brian Houston. That's what it actually said. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So what they're doing is, is putting some preparatory groundwork in for uh, handing over some other stuff. But she also has the Secret Garden TV. Now, can I stop you there? No. Because the Secret Garden is a euphemism for a woman's vagina. I have not made this up. So we've got the bishop, grandpa, and now she is pioneering the Secret Garden TV. This is ridiculous. Hmm. So, yeah. do they know what they're doing here, or is this purely just some sort of Jungian, Freudian thing? It's Freudian. Mm. I do love Freud, so I, I do think it's Freudian. Um, they surely, surely, they their marketing people aren't very bright, are they? If, hey, if, hey, keep keep reading because remember, this is a secret garden. Keep reading what it actually says about this, or what you're going to do with your secret garden. Go on. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. Uh, a space designed to reach and inspire young women by compelling them to dig deeper into the things that consume <laughs> their hearts. <laughs> So, so dig deeper, ladies. Now, when I first read that, I thought dig deeper into your wallet, but now I think it's maybe something about digging deeper the into the garden. garden. <laughs> it's not good. But, you know, what are they essentially doing? Jobs for the boys. They're leaning in. They are. They're leaning in financially, but also both these two kids have very high-ranking, powerful jobs. I would love to know what their credentials were besides going to the actual Hillsong Bible College. What are their credentials to hope? I doubt they're there. 
But anyway. Oh, but wait, there's more. Oh, come on. Here, steak here, knives, come on. Here, here's the steak knives. Another son, Ben Houston. So Ben is married to Lucille, and together they're the global online lead pastors of Hillsong Church, which I'm sure during COVID saw a massive expansion. Yeah, they saw millions of hits, hundreds of millions of hits, I think. So this is no small role either. No, this is massive. What are they? They are passionate about God and the church and have a real heart to see people find hope, life and answers in Jesus Christ. Yeah, and also really, really keen to see Dad give jobs for the boys. Yes, it's all racked and stacked, isn't it? None of the kids have had to go and work outside of the family business. Not for very long anyway. No, but very recently, what's Brian done? He's announced that Ben and his daughter-in-law would be pursuing their dream of starting Hillsong LA in the OC area sometime in the next year. Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? Of all the people that God would call to take this choice plum of a, of a church, and I could imagine the amount of money that's being thrown at this, because this is Hollywood, right? This is where the you know music scene and the actors and everything are all, this is going to be a big deal. So who's he going to trust with this? Is he going to trust... You know, those feisty leprechauns, the doolies? I don't think so. Oh, no. I don't think so. This is one that's going to go to a Houston. Go to the kids. Yeah. So the dynasty continues, doesn't it? And so so they look at this and they think, Houstons, we don't have a problem. They do. They They do do indeed have a problem. I love what it said here in this article. It said, Ben Houston insisted that his plans for Hillsong's expansion to LA were not indiscriminate, but are intentional, prayed about, and thought through. Oh, that's nice. And fucking nepotistic. Yes. I love it. That's like indiscriminate. Fucking discrimination up your fucking wazoo. This is so discriminatory in a positive sense towards you, Ben and Lucille Houston. But they would see it that they are blessed because they're rubbing shoulders with all the elite in Hollywood. Yeah, that's right. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag Mm -hmm. blessed. So, So what we've seen here today, Reverend Dr. Brian, is that we have seen serious evidence of nepotistic dynasties, both small and large, in the name of the Lord. And that's okay. Australian Pentecostalism. If it's in the name of the Lord, you can get away with it, can't you? Because God has told me, we've prayed about it, we've been given a vision, we've been given a word. and We've been given jobs for the boys. Yeah, but dare, dare not question that. Because if you do that, you're questioning God, aren't you? Because do you remember what they used to say to us once upon a time? And you probably heard this a lot as well, and you hear this from the leaders, is church is a theocracy, not a democracy. <laughs> yes. Right. Which reminds me again of this hereditary title shit. You know, I mean, that's really what happened in, you know, in those European monarchies, God put them there and God would cause the boy or the daughter to be born to me. And that is the next person. It's all God. It's all on God. So it's a theocracy, not a democracy. And you don't have a say. No, you absolutely don't. And particularly, you know, you look at the rise of the mega church in Australia, I mean, globally, but if we're just concentrating on Australia here, I can't think, I mean, I'm not involved in the scene, I'm not close to it, and I'm not actually that close with too many people that are. But I'd love to hear examples of where these churches have been handed over to someone who's not related or someone who's not part of one of these royal Pentecostal families. Oh, look, it, it does happen because there are times where they're, you know, the, the as I said before, the person is not, you know, the son or the daughter is not old enough yet, or this, you know, the person gets removed um, or something goes horribly wrong and, you know, or, or, or there just isn't a child at all. So occasionally it definitely does happen within within Pentecostal churches that some, you know, that people get it. But by and large, this nepotism is still a huge issue. And I think the thing that really struck me is, and I want to say this to people that are involved in it, not, not those of us that have walked away. When you give your money to these churches, you are actually giving your money to families and family businesses. Yeah. And so you, you could argue, hey, this is how fi- family businesses work in the world. You know, you've got camping store, for example, and our family has been, you know, running that for a while and, you know, they're handed on to their children 100%, right? And that's okay for them. But these are churches, and this money doesn't come from selling stuff, etc. It comes from donations, and it comes from communities building their communities. And so, in essence, this should be owned 
and controlled by the church communities and not just in some sort of superficial way with stacked boards and, you know, full of sycophants, etc. And these boards organise themselves legally. I'm not suggesting that they're not. But is it ethical? Is it right? And who are these board members in your local church or in your huge mega church? Where does the power, where does the control actually land? And when you're giving 10% of your salary, right, as a tithe and offering every week, who are you giving that money to? Where's it going? Who's controlling it? I think you've got to ask these questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm involved in a couple of boards for organisations and and I can tell you the diversity on those boards is enormous and it's purposefully done that way to make sure that we are challenging the status quo, that we are challenging some of the assumptions there. And I would dare say that you're, you're right, they stack these so the assumptions aren't challenged, so the status quo isn't challenged and they can continue along their merry way. As you say, I mean these these are businesses. They, you know, they started off um, as our interview with with Jeff Bullock. You know, Jeff said that they it started out in all sincerity. This, but it, you know, I'm not quite sure that's where it's landed. I mean, these are. Well, you're more than not quite sure. This is not where it's landed. Yeah, but I like to understate things. I'm Australian. Fair so, but you know, it's it's it, it's horrendous. I mean, you you look at this. I mean, this is people's spirituality. It's their eternal destiny. If you're looking through their eyes, um, and it's being messed with in this way. The thing is, for me, Brian, is people are being called to sacrifice for building funds or for missions or whatever it is that they're that they're sacrificing to, but the money is going to these small groups of people and even families that have ultimate control. And yes, it's legal and yes, it's all set up in a way. But, you know, Nathan Zambronio on the Leaving Hillsong podcast, please go back and have a listen to his his podcast if you want. But he really talked about how the way this is all structured, that ultimately it can't be taken away from the leaders. They have these rights of veto and all this kind of stuff. So when you give your money to these groups, you're not building your community, you're building these family businesses. And on top of that, Brian, is the taxation breaks that they get because they are religious organisations. They're not family businesses, according to the taxation office, they are churches. And yet they've got all these tax breaks and they're, you know, jobs for the boys and nepotism and all this kind of stuff. It's just so wrong. Stop giving your money to these, to these family businesses. Yeah, it's madness, isn't it? Like I'd hate to, well, actually I'd really love to know how much actually comes through the offering plates every week um, at, you know, the biggest Hillsong churches because it, it would be enormous. And it's... Um, I think that BBC doco said that it was hundreds of millions of dollars a year are raised through donations and offerings at Hillsong. Hundreds of millions a year. It'd have to be. And, and then you think of the music. You know, the music would make tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars i mean this stuff hits the global charts billboard charts the aria charts in australia i mean this stuff is making some serious coin and then it's all going into the families and then it's all handed on to the families so when brian stood down i don't think his kids are old enough yet or his kids are in a position yet to be able to do this so he had to give it to go chok tong aka those leprechaunish doolies to take over but it's just it's just, you know, interim temporary, you're not a Houston or interim temporary, you're not an Evans or interim temporary, you're not a Smith. This is the way it works. And and I get angry. Can you hear me? It just pisses me off. And I just think you're getting ripped off people. Give your 10%. You know, here's another thing, right? I remember this. The, the, the Bible says, well, he that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. So stop giving to the rich people. If you believe in prosperity, you're supposed to give to the poor. So stop giving to these people. Find your charities, find the things that are doing. Give to them, keep giving, keep being a Christian, but stop getting ripped off. And, or you know, demand some accountability around where this money goes. Uh, I haven't looked, I'd, I'll be interested actually, I'll do this after this episode, of, of getting on and Googling and see if you can see the annual general meeting documents because I know the organisation I work for, we have to publicly declare those documents. We have to put them on a website. They have to be registered and that actually shows the transparency of the finances in there. Also as set up as a board, our activity, how we've acquitted against any funds that have come in from our funders. So I wonder, I wonder if they have to be that transparent. 
Let's Google. And maybe they are. Maybe they are, but ultimately that doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? You can keep all the rules, but is it ethical? And I, and I say it's not. No, I, I, mean, I imagine not as well. And it is, it is quite crazy. And, I mean, you do see this all the time, unfortunately, across the world. So how do we challenge it? What do we do? What do we do with this? Do we just stay angry or do we challenge it somehow? Do we ask people to be empowered to ask the questions, to, to demand accountability, demand transparency, or they withhold their funds? Well, it's really difficult because there's so much manipulation within these mega churches that, hey, don't argue with us. Argue with God. God's put us in this place. God's told us to do this. Don't argue with that. Yeah, well, see, that's exactly what the, the kings and queens of, of Europe used to say. We are put here by God, and if you argue with us, you're arguing with God. But actually, we worked out that was bullshit, and we have whole new forms of government. And so maybe that's what needs to happen. But, hey, it won't. But nevertheless... If I was in there and I was listening to this podcast, I'd be asking questions and I'd be shifting very uncomfortably in my seat. So, you know, listeners, if you do have people that, or if you're in a mega church still yourself, or you have friends within mega churches, maybe encourage them to listen to this. It's all there. It's public information. We haven't made any of this up. A lot of it's from their own websites, let alone from any websites that are giving any commentary on it. It's, it's their own information. Exactly right. So I hope you've enjoyed our little Pelican Brief style episode today. I was Julia Roberts. You were Denzel Washington. I think those oh, are the ones in this. Or was, it, or was it Matthew McConaughey? I can't remember. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to be Matthew McConaughey. Everyone loves him. And, um, you know, I've got a man crush on Matthew McConaughey too. Fair enough. Well, that's the end of this episode. We've run well over time. Thank you for staying with us. It's been It's been a good one. It needed the time. So thank you for staying with us. Thank you for listening. Share it. Google away. If, if you have any questions around this or question what we've said, Google away public information. Yeah, and just remember nepotism is not okay. This, it's not okay in the government. It's not okay in public office. It's not okay in business. And it's certainly not okay in church. Although stand by, in uh, a couple of years, my, my daughters have grown up and I probably will hand the podcast over to them. Oh, wonderful. Good job. All right, mate. I will see you next week. Later.